So we're back at Sonar Festival. It's uh, Friday. This is our third day here. Um, my name's DNS for Barcelona City FM. I'm here today with Molly Newman, who is the head of music at Kickstarter. Thanks for joining us today, Molly. Thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to go straight into the questions. So I want to know more about your band, Brat Mobile. So what was it like being in a girl riot band in the 90s? Yeah, it was uh, it was all that we knew, honestly, because it, we I think we're we're part of a, a collective spirit um, that was really speaking to the time and uh, working to, you know, we started our band because we knew that there weren't that many bands in women with women in them, and that we, uh, although we hadn't been sitting in our bedrooms learning Stairway to Heaven <laughs> all all through high school. Um, you know, we were inspired by our community and, and punk rock and um, figured that we could, you know, make it up as we went along. And so we sort of learned our instruments as we, you know, were writing songs. Um, and I think, you know, we took a break for a number of years and came back and obviously we were more proficient and, you know, technically uh, uh, sharp. But um, the spirit of what we were trying to do was really about, you know, having more voices and recognizing more voices and, um, you know, especially not just in front of the stage or on stage, but the, the women that were um, part of record companies, starting record companies, um, producing music and, you know, doing sound and booking shows. So it's sort of whole ecosystem um, that where women had been playing roles but weren't really recognized for it. Um, and and also to help elevate the vis that visibility so that uh, others would be inspired to do that. Sure, sure, sure. So how do you think, talking about the kind of music industry and women working for record labels, I mean, we know that we should be pushing forward and there should be more labels run by women. Yes. At Kickstarter, how have you seen this change and are you seeing kind of a, a new generation of younger women or women being involved in this these kind of jobs? It, it, it is interesting. I mean, so Kickstarter is very, um, you know, self-service. You know, it's for artists who have an entrepreneurial spirit or have a sort of instinct or um, interest in... Um, in doing the work, it's not easy to run a campaign, um, but it 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 does. I do see evidence over and over, and we don't have we don't actually track gender information of the creators. Um, we we have a lot of policies that where we we are very respectful of privacy, um, so it's. So it's sort of a blessing and a curse because we don't have like hard numbers on you know yeah. n the number of projects, but but I see the number of projects that are run by women and I see the the elevated visibility that they've had and um, certainly you know for the longest time the most successful project in music on Kickstarter was by Amanda Palmer um, and she raised uh, 1.2 million dollars, wow. yeah. So uh, you know and now it's only last year a. a, a, a very unique project came and and raised more than that, but um, you know we we have women. I see women taking control of their careers, connecting with their community, running their projects, and and I think for women or men or a, a any spectrum, um, you know what we are hoping to develop and offer with Kickstarter is a chance for artists to have access to resources that are you know obviously financial. They're raising money, but but they're activating their their story and connecting with their community and um, and it's a really empowering uh, possibility like I said it is not necessarily an easy thing to do um, but it but once I mean I hear it over and over we had a, a wonderful project by Kate Nash um, this past year and you know she was sort of the perfect um, example of she she obviously has uh, had a lot of success in her career and um, has very, very passionate fans. And the way that they responded to her sort of saying, I want you to be my label. I want you to be the ones that help me make this, you know, work that is uh, on my own terms. Um, it was a really incredible thing to see. Great. And also I want to talk a bit about, you've, you're interviewing, or no, yes, you're interviewing Brandon Hickson, yes. who is De La Salle's manager. Right. And they obviously they did a huge crowdfunding campaign, didn't yes. they? Yes, yes. What was your role in that? So actually, I wasn't at Kickstarter when they um, were running the campaign. I joined in January of 2016, and their campaign was April the year prior. Mm -hmm. But um, the album came out last August, so I was part of sort of the you know the final push, of, which is actually fulfilling 
the you know the promise to to the fans that you you know you ask for their support and and obviously things uh you know schedules take over as we all know but um when the record came out um you know we wanted to be as much of a part as we could of you know helping uh them get all the visibility that they could uh and you know there there are structural and you know sort of like technical things that need to happen that that um with, when you have a campaign that big especially they had over 11,000 people back the project um it's hard. Yeah, there's, there's, there are things that come up. Um, but what I think is so fascinating about, about the story, and obviously it was, you know, it charted, it uh, was nominated for a Grammy. Like, it's been received critically and commercially really, really well. And, and we're so proud of, of, you know, the small piece that Kickstarter played as the platform for, for them connecting with their community. And I think what I'm excited to talk to him about on, from a sort of business perspective is you know, the choices that they've made, some of which have been unusual and, uh, you know, they've always been creatively, um, you know, visionary. Yeah. But I think that they have a, a good example of sort of being flexible and innovative on the business side too. And I, I think that people can learn a lot from that. Yeah, sure. And I think, you know, it's really important to engage and connect with your community. And I was quite sh sort of surprised and shocked to, to hear that they were running this kind of campaign. Yeah. Uh, were you surprised and shocked? Or? You know, I they had... So one of the things that they had done uh, in 2014 was they had released all of their music yeah. through BitTorrent. Um, and, and I thought that that was very clever because they were able to... You know, they had not been so active for a few years, but through this, you know, big... Uh, sort of marketing stunt, I guess you will. Uh, you know, they they were able to, you know, get all of these new email addresses and and connect with them and, and you know sort of set themselves up for whatever. I think that they were you know considering all the options with whether it was a label or a license to a label. And um, but I think at the end of the day, uh, you know, they they decided that it was you know this combined with the the visibility that the campaign um, brought. Because it was sort of like, huh, if they do it, what does that mean? Yeah. And I think because they had such a sort of empowering um, presentation of it, that it was really, you know, we, we, get, we know all of the, the sort of, you know, concerns that people have about running a campaign that you, know, you might not be successful or, you know, yeah, what if, what if things go south at some stage? You know, it's, it, there's a lot of pressure and, and in the music business, we kind of like to hide from those <laughs> things. <you know? laughs> we like to let them sort of play out in the back rooms. And when it's front and center, it's that much more more challenging. But I think that that's a very healthy thing for our industry. I think that it's time it's time for, for things to be more transparent and uh, for risk to be assessed in a more healthy way, um, you know. And and sometimes, as, as hard as it might feel, if a campaign isn't successful maybe there is a reason, There's a reason of course. and it's you know rather than having invested in manufacturing production and the whole thing and then those records sit on the shelves or whatever it is you know in the equivalent universe now obviously with streaming that's not the same could issue but um but There's at least you know costs yeah. There's always cost but at least you know that you've done what you wanted to do for the campaign and you own your rights right. Right, right. So, you know, I think that that's a, on, a, on the artistic side, that can be a challenging thing to consider. I think on the business side, it's hard to, you know, that's the function of much of the industry is sort of like a financial structure. Um, and that this is a, d a different way of looking at it. But I really do believe that that we can be a, a part of uh, a, a stronger foundation for the industry that we are not here to replace labels. We're not here to replace the ecosystem that's required to, you know, get music to fans. But we can play a part in, you know, making sure that the fans that really want to support those artists have that opportunity at the highest value. Uh, and then when it is out on all of the, the streaming services, you know, which, you know, we don't have to talk about that here, you know, <laughs> but we know it's like that's not where the money is made anymore. I mean, uh, and so between touring and, and uh, you know, licensing and all of the different pieces that I think we can be a, a part for the right artists, um, not all of them, you know. Yeah. So... What is your opinion about the sort of female representation at Sonar this year? How have you found it? I think it, I think I, I mean it's it's wonderful to see the sort of um, uh, 
uh, thought and thoughtfulness that's been put into, I think, from Sonar into having women, you know, sort of on the business, on the plus D sec, um, aspect, and obviously on stage, there are a number of, you know, fantastic women performers. So I think that's, that's the critical piece, is that there's a recognition from the side of the conferences and festivals mm -hmm. um, that, that there needs to be parity or, or aspire to be you know, equal, whether it, you know, and that's not just for gender, there's all sorts of diversity things that need to be addressed in our industry. Um, but, so I'm very refreshed to see the, like I said, the thoughtfulness, uh, because I, it's, it's conference season, so on the business side, you know, you still do go over and over to conferences and see six men on stage talking about a topic where you know there's expertise um, and it, it's it just is required and obviously there's lots of issues there's availability travel blah 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 but it just needs to be a priority and I think that it's time that uh, those who are organizing things really do recognize that um, you know that should be just as critical um, as as anything and I you know you hear about companies when they're in their hiring practices like if they don't have you know a variety and a diversity of applicants that they go back to the drawing board and i think that that's something that we might it's time for that yeah for sure okay so one final fun question uh your top two tracks to party two. Oh, that's a good one <laughs> um i love uh Give Me Back My Man by the B-52s. Okay. That's, That's one of my favorite, <laughs> like I can't do without it. And one of my guilty pleasures is um, uh, Glory. Um, Morning Glory by Oasis. Really? So it's like, it's it's the title track, but it's not, it was like a dead single, but it's one of my favorites. <laughs>